Um, we now have a, an exciting discussion of a number of different cross-sector leaders, people who have worked in the public and private sector, but who are part of this uh, civic startup ecosystem. And one of the ways it's really incredible and to, to see happening amongst this group of people is the type of collaboration and opportunities for program, projects, initiatives across the different sectors of this, of this work. So with that, I'd like to introduce Rob Kronicke from California Forward, who will be moderating this panel. Uh, he himself has also worked uh, in government, has worked in nonprofit, and is uh, also uh, a, an entrepreneur in his own right as a small business uh, owner. So, uh, Rob, if you would uh, join us up at the front and uh, thank you, Jeremy. kick off this panel. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. We may or may not be mic'd. Are we mic'd? Right? Yep. Yeah. All right. The last panel was so good that we went and we huddled and we regrouped in the back and said, we need microphones, we really need to bring energy to try and match that. Can we get another hand for our previous panel? Wow. Thanks very much. And thanks, Jeremy, for that introduction. I want to say just a couple words about California Ford real quick before we get to the panel. We are a nonprofit and nonpartisan catalyst for change in our state, and we're working on a whole range of issues to try and improve governance and citizen engagement in California. I'll just run through them really quickly. One of the issues we're really focused on is economic development. We have an annual economic summit. It's something that Kish has been involved in before, and really trying to focus on regional ways to stimulate job growth across California. Another area that we're very engaged in is realignment, which is kind of the historic move in the state to um, realign the way we do criminal justice. And then the third uh, component, the part that I had up, um, is really focused on transparency and trying to engage citizens in our democracy and try to really modernize the way the government operates. And a real common thread throughout all three of those issues is data. You know, we need good data to evaluate this change in our criminal justice system. Kish and others are calling for more data to find out what the economic activity is around our state. And of course, we need good data and we need good data sharing to try and stimulate more transparency and more government accountability. So it's really a natural for California Ford to be involved in this. We're very pleased um, to be participating with Brian and others um, to put this on. We did ourselves a data summit in Sacramento this past March, and actually just about a week or 10 days ago, um, Brian and I and others uh, were down in San Bernardino in a very similar event with local government, um, which is where I kind of come from. I worked with the League of Cities for many years, and really trying to kind of connect um, the innovators that are out there in the public and the uh, nonprofit and the private sector um, together with local jurisdictions, and that's really what our panel is about here today. It's, um, it's this ecosystem that's working together to try and improve uh, local government in our state. Is my mic okay? Yes, okay. Okay. It's echoing back at me. So, um, I want to try and tee up our panel by really talking about open data and kind of what I perceive as the challenges and the opportunities uh, that it presents, particularly for government. Brian, in his remarks, he talked about Proposition 42, and I, I want to just touch on that again really quickly. How many people have heard of Proposition 42? Okay, so almost everyone. So I won't spend too much time on it, but I think it's very notable that essentially what this did is it, it kind of papered over an administrative issue in the way that state reimburses cities for the Brown Act and Public Records Acts. But it, there's a very uh, important line, almost like a footnote in Prop 42, and there was an alert that went out from Best Best and Krieger, which is a law firm as many city attorneys um, across the state, that highlighted the fact that Proposition 42 not only eliminates reimbursements for the Public Records Act, but any future laws passed in furtherance of that act. Essentially what that means is the legislature is now empowered to reframe the way cities communicate information, whether that be their agendas, the reports they submit up to the controller, business permits, anything. Really, And we strongly believe that there are a lot of legislators that are going to take up that mantle. So it may present a kind of immediate challenge for cities to try and engage and really get up to speed, um, even, even among those who are already leaders. The other is really kind of a cultural shift, right? Um, people are expecting that information and their interactions, particularly with government, um, are easy, right? I mean, they do online banking. Whether it's Twitter or Tinder, whatever people do, they're doing it online, and they want that to be very simple. So um, VJ, I think in his remarks earlier, really talked about what the opportunities are, and of course it's transparency. And um, some folks in the last panel really talked about how we're moving beyond just transparency, which I think is a great thing. Open data is important for that, but I think it can be marginalized if that's all we think it is. There is a tremendous economic development opportunity. Um, McKenzie placed the value of open data across the nation at three to five trillion dollars. And if you think about the size of California and the size of our economy within that, you can see why Kish and others are really interested in it. 
And of course, there's uh, the efficiencies and all the ways we can evaluate what we're doing in government, where we're putting our resources, and how, um, how we can improve how we do what we do. So it really raises kind of the third thing, and I'm going to start introducing my panel with that, is what is the capacity for government to meet all of those needs? There's a recent survey um, of government IT folks by NetApp that said they had just about 50% of the, of the infrastructure they needed and maybe only about a third of the personnel they need to try and meet the demands and, and meet the opportunities presented by open data. So what I think that means is you really do need an ecosystem. You really, cities need help, and they need people from the private sector, the nonprofit sector, and strong innovators from within government to try and um, get to where we want to go. So we've got some really great people in the room today, and I'm going to invite some of them up um, here to lead off our panel. Can I get Ed Shikeda, city manager of San Jose, to come up? Um, those of you that don't know Ed, he's a city manager. He's been with the city for a little bit over a decade, and he comes to us from the city of Long Beach, which is my hometown. Oh, really? Thank Excellent. You. <laughs> it's your vlog. <laughs> Let's see if I want. Julia Burkhead, you want to come on up? <laughs> Julia is a deputy director at the Community Technology <laughs> Alliance. Um, this uh, provides critical technology services to aid in preventing and ending homelessness and poverty. She's got some great thoughts on that. Mark Head from Acela, coming on up. Um, Mark is with Acela, and he was Philadelphia's first ever chief data officer and also the government uh, relations director at Code for America. We have lots of great Code for America folks in the room. Hand for Mark. <laughs> Last but not least, Kaylin Gallagher, co-leader of Code for San Jose. Kaylin's on the Campbell Union High School uh, uh, District Board, and is, he has a passion for using technology to address community needs. So thanks. Welcome, guys. <laughs> So I want to start off with a question. I'll start with you, Ed. Ed, what do you see as the role of your organization in local civic innovation? How can the city of San Jose support any one of the three kind of opportunity areas I talked about? Great, great. Happy to comment on that. And as you might expect, I, I had a little bit of time to think about some of the comments I'd like to make uh, before the session today. But that said, I'm going to throw them out the window uh, because the conversation is actually really provocative and. and the feedback is as well. So the, uh, just the, the opportunity to talk about uh, the, the evolution of the conversation, as, as we've said. So basically, for San Jose, we see a couple of uh, areas of particular uh, focus for ourselves. One is certainly as a partner, and we've talked about a number of uh, opportunities, areas of uh, particular interest uh, that can be uh, areas where San Jose, being Silicon Valley, being a, a large city, are uniquely positioned to be able to pursue on areas from everything from uh, economic development to clean technology to public safety or and go on and on from there. But that said, perhaps the second area that's worth noting, uh, and in particular a role that we play uh, from the public sector, is a recognition of some of the, the minefields and some of the particular challenges that need to be confronted along the way. And as, as we talk about um, and think about uh, some of the experiences we've had over the last many years, going from open government to more broadly uh, transparency, how we are working in partnership with the private sector, uh, we've somewhat fallen into, uh, I'll call it three general categories or streams uh, by which the conversations tend to go. One would be, in particular, our interaction with the private sector. One would be the traditional procurement route, where we're buying stuff. And so there's basically a purchase uh, a, a arrangement or relationship between the city and, and the private sector. Second, that has been an area of uh, great interest for us and, and that has been uh, very successful is an area of joint development, where San Jose, again, recognizing where we are and who we are, taking advantage of uh, the interest in the community, the private sector community that's here to help develop products, develop services in a way that can then be used elsewhere. So we're more than happy to work together. We've got examples on everything from uh, LED street lights and traffic signals once upon a time to uh, electric vehicle charging, a number of uh, energy systems and the like. So joint development is another uh, very important area for us. And the third, that's really the Silicon Valley Telecom Partnership model, is to take the, the philanthropic interest uh, and find uh, where the, the intersection is between where there's a, a professional development need, a professional development interest, let's say from a company locally, and the city's need for services. Where's that intersection and, and how can we work together in order to meet both of those needs? So those three general streams have become somewhat core business for us. And so that said, 
as a city, we're in the business of delivering services to the community. So it's very important for us to stay doggedly focused on the services that are priority for our community. So we, unless things fit within one of those uh, general streams, it can be very difficult to work with us because we're focused on getting things done, develop, delivering services on the street, and uh, anything that can take away from that, you may not get the most open-minded, R&D focused, uh, uh, open uh, discussion. So I think it's important for us to, to recognize that, as a, as certainly at a staff level, that you're, you may encounter, unless it's something that directly relates to the services we're providing, that may be difficult to work with us. That said, then on the other extreme, on the <coughs> traditional procurement purchasing side, that's where the conversations can get, um, I'll say, tricky. Because uh, to a certain extent, when we're buying something, we won't want to talk to anyone who might be providing something that we're trying to buy. So uh, the rules that apply, depending on which one of those streams you're into, will vary greatly. But you know, that's it. That's the role we play, and more than happy to advance and, and pursue any or all of those. I think that this, um, this concept of, of changing government procurement around data issues is really great. It's something we heard about a little bit in our last panel. Mark, can you talk from the private sector perspective? How do you view your role in aiding cities and local governments? Sure. So um, Excella has about 500 customers. Our role and the thing that actually is really for the company is to help them uh, understand the value of their data and publishing it as open data, uh, and also to help them build partnerships with outside developers, uh, with civic startups who work very closely with capitalists and open counter. We are supporters of Code for America and the uh, Brigade Program. Um, so that's, I think, how companies like Excella can help governments um, make the connection with outside innovators. Um, we actually have a developing program that John helped run that is focused on building the partnerships between helping outsiders bring their ideas to government and help governments implement these ideas to provide those core services in ways that are efficient, more innovative, uh, and ultimately um, some more facilitation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so to that end, Julia, you're in um, community services. Can you talk about, you know, you've got Mark helping Ed, data out there. How do you guys utilize that data that you group up? You know, it's been a challenge so far. So, so Community Technology Alliance's mission is to um, harness technologies to empower communities to develop data-driven solutions to poverty and homelessness. Um, it's it's a big mission, um, and and I think right now the challenge is that that it, it is hard to put all the data together. Right? It's all sitting separately right now. Um, so we're working hard with our nonprofit partners to, to try to bring together what we can. Um, but some of the challenges that were mentioned earlier, things like a lack of standards in how to bring that information together, is standing in the way. Um, and we believe that if we can put it together, we, we can find solutions to issues like homelessness. Um, that was brought up here today. It isn't a huge problem. Uh, Silicon Valley has a large unsheltered homeless population in the country, and it's unacceptable. We need to do something about it. We have the data to do it. We have the money to do it. We've got the technology to do it. We've got to get all that stuff together. Great. And so, code for San Jose. Yeah. How do you guys then fill in, fill in all these gaps? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know if we fill them all in. Um, yeah. But yeah. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, probably a couple months old. Um, yeah, code for San Jose. I mean, basically, what we did is we uh, made that pretty logo you see there. Um, my roommate works at Facebook. We ran a lot of free Facebook ads and said, show up at this place at this time and let's see what happens. Um, and what we found is that there's a lot of interest from people who aren't necessarily uh, in government in in this in this realm officially, um, who are interested in helping make San Jose better, um, helping solve the problems that they see um, you know, by themselves, just using open data um, and using the skills that they use in, in their day-to-day -day life, whether that's being a, a coder at Google or um, working for the labor council down the street, right? Or you know whatever it is that they do, they they feel they can make a difference. Um, and so, uh, I don't know, we, we have our civic hack nights and really that's, it's kind of like a magical place where people come in and they're like, let's just, let's just try to tackle this tonight and, and see what happens and, and go from there. What are you talking about? Um, so we have a few projects right now. Um, one of the big ones is kind of transparency around financial data uh, that, that comes into uh, to campaigns. Um, so we have a team of people who are working on visualizing all the contributions to the uh, Cortez and Licardo races, um, uh, putting on a map so you can see where the money's coming from, um, seeing kind of where the uh, influence might be, um, and 
that's something that didn't work out like the last month. So where does that live then? Does that live in the code for San Jose, or do you give that back to the city? How does it work? Um, so I think there's. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I think one like that. You wouldn't want to talk about it, right? <laughs> But I think that's the beauty of it, right? Is I think um, we have, we, we live in, you know, the capital of Silicon Valley. We are, the people who live here are, are really innovating and doing amazing things every day. Um, some of the stuff they're going to make is going to be stuff that will, uh, is directly aligned with the city's interests, right? For example, um, Michelle did this thing with the city bike share data and showed how it was being used, and it, it visualizes data for the first time. And it's really, really cool. Um, then there's the stuff where you know maybe it points out something that the city might not necessarily want to point out, but um, you know I think the, the idea is that if you have this out there, then things get fixed. And it's cool. Okay, so to our folks, to so everyone but Ed, and you know whoever wants <laughs> oh, to to go in first here, um, tell me what is the biggest opportunity the data presents to San Jose? Go. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Answers. I think another thing that hasn't been talked about is just uh, getting government ready for the next generation, right? Um, if you're a millennial, right, and you grew up and you're a digital native, or the kids who are in fifth grade now who are not just digital natives but mobile natives, um, I think their first interaction with government is kind of shocking because it's very different from all the things they grew up with their entire lives. Um, it's and not so great for Gen X. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not, I'm not trying to do some ageist thing or anything, but. Um, I mean, that was, that was my experience when I, I ran for school board, right, in West San Jose and Campbell and, and got on. And, like, just seeing how things worked was very, uh, it was shocking to me. Um, and the, the lack of use of, like, we didn't use data to make decisions at all. It was, it was a foreign concept to kind of the power, the people who are in power. Um, and so I think what open data does is it allows, uh, you know, cities to conquer those, those issues directly. Great. Okay, so Ed, you've heard, you've heard from our ecosystem here. I want to ask you about the opportunities, but I want to touch on something that Julia brought up as well. She kind of mentioned that um, as part of her efforts to end homelessness, she needs city data, she needs county data, she needs data from a whole host of different agencies. So sitting as the city manager, can the city play a role in trying to facilitate that interaction to help her with what she's doing? And then independent of that, what do you think are the biggest opportunities for the city? Hmm. Well, maybe I try to connect the two together, but that's it. Certainly, the city uh, can and should have a role in supporting the uh, the interests, and and clearly, as just described, it's an interest that we share. Um, part of the trick, and I think the trick uh, for all uh, all of us, and ultimately just following on the comments that were made, is to be able to communicate those interests and those opportunities to the people who are currently involved in the in the machine, basically, and, and working. And, and thinking they're doing the best for the people, and what is this open data thing? And why, why would I take away from the work I'm doing, the important work I'm doing, to help with this effort? And I think that, so, so that said, the, the challenge is really a communication form, and one of being able to express the, the common interest and the common uh, opportunity that then forms the foundation of working together. And, and my first comment here was one of needing to have a common vocabulary, and to a certain extent I'll come back to that, because uh, it, it really is important to be able to express that common interest and to find that common interest. Because quite frankly, I think much of the, the discussion and some of the, the literature suggests that open data is in opposition to what is a, an assumption of a closed system, and a system that's closed by design and protecting itself. You know, some of that's true, but I think by and large it's not. If people who are inside the system were able to see where the opportunities are as well. So, and again, full circle, that's where the opportunity is. And certainly an opportunity here in San Jose and in Silicon Valley to demonstrate how there is that common interest and common um, purpose that can be built up going forward. Okay. Well, maybe doubling back on my earlier question, but what's part of our script? I'll start with you, Ed. 
how do you see these programs in San Jose within a larger context of what's going on either here in the county, here in the Bay Area, across California and beyond? You know, we, San Jose has done such great work in convening this event, bringing people in the city together. They've got so much going on in their backyard. How can the city help lead? Well, I think to a certain extent, our opportunity to lead may be less about the app itself or any particular um, circumstance, any particular project than it is in the interrelationships. You know, just by virtue of scale, because of the variety of issues that we're involved with and the variety of people that are involved, that through that uh, large community, I think we've got the opportunity uh, to demonstrate that there's the common interest. And, and there are, uh, by example, uh, how we can build the business model that shows government working with nonprofits, working with the private sector, and demonstrating our ability to, to work in, that, in, that, in each other's wheelhouse in a way in, in going forward. Okay, Mark, you guys work with 500 cities across the nation. How can San Jose or how can any city really kind of take up the mantle of data and, and help, um, help propagate this? Well, well I, I, besides I, hiring so. Right. <laughs> a couple, <laughs> now you're in there. Procurement <laughs> streams. Um, I think a couple things. So, um, one, I think by virtue of you being here, um, you're, you are taking up the mantle and um, um, sending a signal to others in government, this is important. It's worth your time to come here and have this dialogue. Um, the other thing I would say too is you can share ideas. Um, when I worked for the city of Philadelphia, the question we always got was, how did Philly do, it, do this? How did you get to the point you were at? And especially for, I mean, there are a lot of cities the size of Philadelphia, right? There are a lot more cities, um, the mid-market cities that are, that are, are, are out there um, wrestling with this problem, wondering well, how do we get started? So I would, I would throw a shout out to the Code for America Peer Network and say that um, that's one channel through which um, San Jose and other cities can share ideas. Um, the question that always comes up, I heard this question probably 10,000 times in the two years I worked in Philadelphia, um, why do I want to do this? Um, what benefit am I going to get out of this? Um, and how am I going to do it uh, in a way that doesn't impact something else I'm supposed to be doing? And those are all logical questions that someone working in government is going to ask. Um, so I think, I think um, by virtue of you being here, taking part in this discussion, um, that's a great, a great way to start. Uh, I would encourage you to share your experiences and reach out to others around the country because everybody's out there wrestling with these same ideas. And there's a wealth of information that's available um, for, for you to use. Okay, Julia, I like your issue because it's a specific policy issue and one that obviously we can and should solve. Is there a way that you think um, the city of San Jose here could be even more helpful to you? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the city of San Jose is a great partner of ours. Um, and we're excited to be working with them now on this issue specifically as well. I think that, um, uh, to Mark's point, I think there's some great national movements um, in this area, and I think San Jose, as, as an acknowledged leader in technology in every sector, has the opportunity to continue pushing some of those national conversations forward. Things along you know, national, the national information exchange model, right? Taking some of what started there and, and actually saying, let's, let's try it, or let's, let's be the example community. Can we, can we make this happen? Um, that's what I'd really like to see, and to, to set the standard by which all communities can start doing the same. Is there a recognized leader from a technology perspective of a state or local government that's working to help solve homelessness? Besides San Jose? Right. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, Sydney. Is there a recognized leader in state or local government that's providing new or different data that helps solve the homelessness issue that San Jose could emulate? Everyone's struggling with it right now. I think we have the chance to be the leader, the ones that are emulated. Here's what's really exciting about what you said. The data is there, right? It's there. It's, it's all there. there. We have, I was sharing um, earlier. Much bigger, much bigger problem with the data. 200,000 client records in my system right now. And, and hundreds of thousands more in the county systems. So it's there. Let's do something with it. Let's figure it out. Caitlin, you're doing stuff with the data all the time. Yeah. Um, how many? Do you know how many brigades there are across the country? It's a good Off question. Uh, Is it good for America oh, folks? A lot. a lot. Over 50? Over 50 and growing all yeah. the time. Yeah. So given that you're here in San Jose, I'm sure a lot of other brigades are looking to you in the Silicon Valley to be an innovator, right? Maybe, what, hopefully. What, how, can, how can the San Jose brigade um, help the city get to where we want it to be? Um, so I think one thing we're trying to do is just create a magical space where innovation happens, right? And so it's it's not much more complicated than being like, hey, everyone show up here. Uh, we're gonna work on issues. 
if you're really passionate, like, hey, I have this data and I just don't have the like the skills or the budget or whatever to like build the app that I'm envisioning, like come and pitch it to the group. Um, and our job is to get people who might not have the vision or might not know exactly what it is that needs to happen, but like are really, really passionate or have like some, you know, they can build an app overnight. Um, and so, you know, we do our bi-weekly hack nights um, and we're trying to do quarterly hackathons so that we can just keep those types of conversations happening. Um, yeah, I think that's our main thing. And let me, if I could add to that, we've got a specific example involving Code for San Jose and the homelessness issue. Um, I know that part of the discussion as, as the organization is, is uh, standing up, it has been what's the, the first projects, where, where to, to, to uh, kind of get your feet wet on, on the front end. One issue uh, was or, and is uh, where are the potential apps around homelessness? And there was an example of an app that came out of San Francisco that was focused around connecting an individual with the services that they might be needing, might be interested in. So, perfect example again, in terms of some of the communication and relationship issues, that, and again, for me, just kind of watching it going by via email, that the, the conversation turned from, hey, there's this app that we might be able to move from San Francisco over to San Jose, and let's, let's see if we can make that work. Well, the conversation ultimately recognized once it connected with our agencies that are involved um, from a task force perspective, that, well, that's nice, the, the real need, uh, if, if the agencies were to uh, prioritize where to put the focus, it would be to take nonprofit organizations that are already very uh, hungry for help or to help with the agencies that have a sense of where the help is needed and connect them instead. Rather, so rather than at an individual level, it was at an organizational um, level. And so looking at that as really that intersection again of interest between coders and agencies uh, is an important conversation to have. Now ultimately, the skill set, the interest, the timing may not be right for any particular organization to be able to, okay, let's make turn that into action, but it's the starting point, and it's a starting point for the somewhat filtering process of thinking through, are we in the right position to do it? If we're not, then is there another part of this broader networked community that can jump on this issue? So that's to a large extent where the innovation happens. Terrific. So it's no surprise that San Jose is very well positioned to succeed in the open data environment. We have a very forward looking um, city manager. We've got great folks surrounding him from the private and nonprofit sectors. And I know I think two or three people in the audience. So if none of you ask a question, I will start calling on people. <laughs> question. You mentioned that we have the data. You know, it's all over the place. But a lot of the data is locked up in, in Paper. It's locked up in boxes. It's locked up in multiple desk drawers. How do we get from that meat world into this virtual world of actually making it work? And that, that's hard stuff. It's it's true. It's true. And um, I, I think that most of it is in databases, though not great ones necessarily. <laughs> right? um, sometimes we're talking as rudimentary as Excel, but it is mostly electronic at this point. Um, I, I think that the biggest challenge actually that we face with, at least with the sector that I'm talking about and the type of data that we're looking at is policy, right? This is data about people. There are a lot of laws about sharing data about people. Um, and that's the biggest challenge I think that we're facing in trying to overcome, overcome this issue. Um, but it's not insurmountable. And that's, that's where these policy discussions uh, need to happen and like, just keep building on some of the agreements we've already put in place to allow data sharing about people when it's to benefit the people, right? I mean, the laws about privacy were put in place for a reason. They were put in place to protect people. Um, but at this point, it's protecting them from good almost as much as it's protecting them from bad. And, um, and so trying to find a way to, to, to be creative and still, and still protect um, people's privacy and security um, as much as possible. I think one of the things that we're really excited about right now is, is taking all of those different data sources, things like um, the housing that's that's currently controlled by nonprofits but funded by government, um, the housing that's run by government, um, the housing that's run by the private market, looking at all the vacancy across all those different housing programs, and then starting to try to find um, how to get the right clients into the right programs so that we're not um, over-serving. We're using our government resources effectively. The, the highly subsidized housing units go to the people who need highly subsidized housing units, not to the people who could get away with a moderately subsidized housing unit or even an unsubsidized housing unit, right? We need to right-size our system of care, and we need to do that by looking at the 
totality of the client population, at the history of how we've served, at the totality of the available housing market, and making those connections appropriately. Um, it's a lot to put together, but I think we can do it. And actually, we have a mandate to do it. The federal government says we have to do it um, within the next year or two. So that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> um, I was going to say, uh, in, in my school district, we actually went from a paper to digital transition uh, around one thing in particular, which was suspensions and expulsions. Um, <laughs> when I got elected, I realized we were suspending and expelling a lot of people, and I wanted data on it. And the answer was the data doesn't exist, it's on paper. Um, and so over a series of months, our staff would spend like an hour a day just manually entering this stuff in back to like three or four years. Um, and uh, it was a it was a tough process, but what came out of it is the new process, right? The new process is, hey, if there's a suspension, it instantly is, is uh, electronic, and it's machine readable, and you know, it's, it's public. Um, or it's not public yet, but hopefully, uh, once we get past some of those issues. <laughs> uh, privacy issues. But, but it's, uh, get, converting the stuff is tough. Setting a new policy saying just like everything from here on out is no longer on paper is, is a little easier. But it takes work. One more question. To that point, I mean, a lot of data does exist, but it becomes timed out rather quickly. So in our case, we do data entry, but it often runs months behind. I know in speaking to other open data groups, they want it no matter what. But how relevant is it to the needs you're trying to serve if it is six months old? Can you give us a little context where you work? What department? Well, I, I, I am the open government manager for the city of San Jose. Indeed. And we get a lot of public records requests. And, and this is another area that kind of causes confusion for me because we have a population of members of our constituencies that want to get information about things that are going on in the government. And then we have these organizations that want data. And there's a struggle between the constituency's need and the need to produce these masses of data. And so that right there causes a bind for staff on where do we spend our time and effort. But then when we give data out, you know, financial data is a, is a big, big one. They want all checks, not cashed. And you know, these things run months behind. So at the point you get it, you're able to publish it and make use of it. What are you really getting from that? And then we're spending our time and effort trying to create that for you. Is it, is it a wasted effort at that point? Mark, you guys have got an app for that, I'm sure. <laughs> I, I, I don't think it's a wasted effort. Um, I think, you know, it was mentioned earlier about the um, tying open data to the, the RFP process. Um, you know, a lot of the people that I've talked to in government um, have said, why would, you, why would anybody want that as open data? It's, it's six months old, or it's, it's incomplete, or it's, it's whatever the, the rationale was. Um, and I think a, a, lot of, um, a lot of the reason that Situations like that exist is because there there hasn't been a data culture inside government. There hasn't been uh, a culture that says data has is it, incredibly powerful uh, operational value, um, and we've invested in our IT systems in a way that reflects that attitude. So now I think as as both people outside, whether they're nonprofits or they're innovators, start using this data, and as governments themselves, governments are also benefiting from this renaissance of tools that can use data. Uh, they're going to start investing more strategically and say, I, I want systems that let me seamlessly grab data and, and connect it to other databases and, and use an overarching data model that makes sense. Um, I mean, we'll, we'll grow out of it. When I say we, I'm talking about governments. We'll grow out of this phase where you know, we've got these legacy systems that don't let us do these things. Um, but in, in, in lieu of that, I would say that any data we have is important. Someone's going to want it, and that someone might be government itself. Thanks to our panelists. Thank <laughs> you.